Over the past several months, I and at least some of my colleagues on the council have been struggling with the issues surrounding the proposed bailout of the Carmel Redevelopment Commission. For several years, I have been concerned that the CRC was incurring millions of dollars in debt, purposely avoiding the scrutiny of the elected city council, by law, the city's fiscal body. I am here today to express my own personal concern with the abuses that brought us to this tipping point. When the original proposal to have the citizens of Carmel potentially burdened with nearly $200 million in CRC debt was presented, many background documents of real information were not provided to the Council. Moreover, the deliberately complex debt instruments hampered the Council's understanding and indeed probably even the understanding of some of the CRC commissioners. Regardless, the taxpayers had no real voice in how the Commission spent the money until the CRC and the mayor had no choice but to request a bailout. There should be no misunderstanding here. The CRC's proposal for refinance is nothing more than a taxpayer bailout, without which they cannot survive. The council determined that an independent review and analysis of the proposed bailout, the largest single bond issue in Carmel's history, was needed and should include the underlying transactions and relationships between the CRC and the Carmel City Center Community Development Corporation, more commonly known as the 4CDC. The law firm of Frost Brown Todd was engaged to lead this effort. Frost Brown Todd has been reviewing the bailout proposal. Frost Brown Todd also engaged an independent financial consultant to analyze the underlying financial assumptions and their reasonableness. They will ultimately prepare a summation report which will be presented and discussed at an open council meeting. Even before the council was asked to bail out the CRC, I was deeply concerned about their lack of transparency and consultation with the council. Due in large part to the obfuscations of the mayor and people close to him, the public only had a nebulous idea about the character of the financial transactions and the rising level of risk. The mayor has publicly admitted that he intentionally avoided council review in a September 9th Indy Star article. CRC member Jeff Worrell actually said that knowing what he knows now and given the opportunity, he would do it all over again. Let's break that statement down. Commissioner Worrell is saying that he would once again create a scheme by which the constitutional checks and balances would be avoided deliberately circumvent the duly elected fiscal body and rack up an unsustainable level of debt that he would then propose to put on the backs of the taxpayers. I find this attitude in a public official unacceptable. The reason for this news conference today is to share with the public a small insight into why I, for one, intend to proceed with an abundance of caution. I regret that we cannot simply rely on statements made in support of the bailout action by the mayor or the CRC. In reviewing the financial statements of the CRC and 4CDC, we learned that the primary source of revenue for the 4CDC was the CRC, one way or another. The CRC itself is primarily funded from property taxes in the form of tax increment. It is my opinion that public funds are public funds and no amount of financial sleight of hand can convert them. No matter how you spin it, the 4CDC's money is taxpayer money. We also learned that in January of this year, the 4CDC issued a check in the amount of $100,000, but the recipient of the $100,000 was redacted in the document we received. We did not know who received that money. Very recently, we learned the check had been written to Mr. Stephen Libman, former CEO for the Centers for the Performing Arts. The members of the 4CDC, who presumably agreed to this, are Rich Taylor with National Bank of Indianapolis, Ron Carter, a member of the City Council, and Bruce Kimball, a community volunteer. All of these individuals are appointed to the 4CDC either directly or indirectly by Mayor Brainerd. Repeated requests for the supporting documentation underlying this payment were delayed and deflected. Recently, the parties bowed to the pressure and provided the confidentiality agreement 
which Mr. Libman had been required to sign in order to receive the settlement payment. This whole chain of events is very interesting as neither the 4CDC nor the mayor had any authority with regard to Mr. Libman's employment. What was the 4CDC's authority to tender this payment and why was it covered up? More troubling were the actions of the mayor and his representatives. In January 2012, prior to Frost Brown Todd's discovery of the payment to Mr. Libman, the city attorney, Mr. Doug Haney, provided the council through email a, quote, settlement agreement between Mr. Libman, the mayor, and Mr. Haney. Mr. Haney's accompanying cover letter affirmed, among other things, that this was the settlement agreement among the parties and no money was being paid from city funds. Consistent with Mayor Brainerd's handling of the CRC, the council had no role in the negotiation of or input into the terms of the settlement agreement and offered no approval of it on behalf of the city. As it turns out, the council was not told the whole truth. The confidentiality agreement between Mr. Libman and the 4CDC actually incorporated parts of the settlement agreement shown to us by Mr. Haney. It is certainly splitting hairs to say that no city money was paid to Mr. Libman, considering that the overwhelming bulk of revenue of the 4CDC is from the CRC, directly or indirectly. Again, the 4CDC's money is taxpayer money. I think Mr. Haney's statements to council back in January were disingenuous at best and cast real doubt on his credibility as well as his ability to effectively represent the interests of council. Mr. Haney's various statements to the council suggest that he is willing to tiptoe to the very edge of deliberate deception, either intentionally or by omission. Unless, of course, he steps forward to tell us he himself was deceived. Another attorney told Frost Brown Todd that he was unaware of the contents of the redacted 4CDC accounting entry. As recently as October the 9th, Mr. Carl Haas of Wallach, Summers and Haas stated in an email that, quote, I do not believe that Wallace Summers Haas, Wallach, Summers Haas has documents related to the redacted entry. Let me say that again. Quoting Mr. Haas, I do not believe that Wallach, Summers Haas has documents related to the redacted entry. Yet, the confidentiality agreement between the 4CDC and Mr. Libman was drafted on Wallach Summers Haas letterhead and signed by an associate of the firm. Such statements severely impair the public credibility of these professionals and make it exceedingly difficult to proceed in good faith. Don't get me wrong, Mr. Libman may have been entitled to compensation for the repeated statements of the mayor following his hiring of a private firm to investigate Mr. Libman, a private citizen, and Mr. Libman's subsequent resignation. It is the cover-up of the action that I find most disturbing and at odds with our system of open government. The credibility issue begs the question of what else has been covered up through the use of this supposed private entity, the 4CDC. Why were such matters not disclosed to the council? It could have been discussed privately in an executive session which every member of this council would have respected, whether we agreed with the proposed action or not. The fact is that several people, the mayor, Mr. Haney, Mr. Haas, and the four CDC board members, at a mim minimum, appear to have conspired to keep this $100,000 payment secret. If it were not for the due diligence of the council in exploring the details of how the CRC arrived at their $200 million bailout, it would be a secret payment still. Now, I know it will be said that the settlement payment was prudent, that a lawsuit would be protracted and expensive, perhaps more expensive than the settlement payment. This, to me, however, is a specious argument. If the mayor and Mr. Haney had not hired the private investigator and made many intemperate statements to the press, there would have been no grounds for a lawsuit, no settlement payment to cover up, and we would not be standing here today. Saying the payment was prudent business practice is like claiming hero status for saving a drowning victim that you yourself threw in the water. The issue really has nothing to do with Mr. Libman, but instead illustrates the danger of a shadow government operating without the disclosure and fiscal restraint that is exercised by the elected fiscal body. 
The various issues raised should clearly illustrate that while the Council is moving forward with deliberate speed, we must thoroughly investigate each transaction and the details of CRC operations that led to so much public money being spent without the oversight of any elected official other than the mayor. Especially given the pattern of secretive, deceptive actions, we must proceed carefully and we must attempt to restore public credibility. I personally think it's time to clean house at these two organizations, as I have told the mayor in private. I know that several of the long-term CRC members were trying to do their level best, but in the final analysis, the advice and consent they offered took the CRC, and now by extension the entire city, down an extremely unwise path. It's time to thank them sincerely for all the time they have volunteered and bring new eyes, voices, and judgment to the table. Make no mistake, the bailout proposed by the CRC places the taxpayer at risk. Therefore, the Council must be certain that we know all of the implications inherent in this bailout. We, in effect, are in a position of affirming all the actions of the CRC and by extension the 4CDC to the extent they are a part of this proposal. We also need to know that this is the best way to conduct the bailout. I will not vote to potentially burden Carmel taxpayers with close to $200 million in additional debt while any doubts linger as to the accuracy and veracity of what we've been presented. There is no rancor or personal animosity in presenting these facts to you today. I simply believe in the rule of law and that the public's business should be conducted in bright sunshine as our laws intend. Thank you very much. That concludes my prepared statement. I'd be happy to take any questions.